Today I'm going to show you what's inside the Honda D-Series engine and how it works. Now while Honda engines are generally really good, the D-Series was kind of a low point in Honda's engine lineup. This one here is a D17 4-cylinder 1.7 liter engine out of the 7th generation Honda Civic Series. Now taking a quick look at the layout of this engine here, the front of the engine here actually sits on the driver's side of the vehicle as opposed to most 4-cylinder front wheel drive vehicles. You also notice that this engine has a plastic timing cover and that's because it's driven by a timing belt which often likes to fail. You've got a plastic intake manifold over here with a mechanical throttle body linkage which I do like. Coming around the back here the most important thing to note is that this is a VTEC solenoid because this is the VTEC version of the D17 motor being the A2. We've also got a bunch of these heater hoses that connect up into the EGR cooler and this EGR valve which this engine is equipped with. You'll notice here that this engine uses coil packs directly on the plugs and on the valve cover we have an Acura symbol because this is out of a 2002 Acura EL that's why it's the VTEC version. We've got a metal valve cover, aluminum head and aluminum block as well as an aluminum oil pan at the bottom. First thing I'm going to do is remove the intake manifold so I'm going to start by removing all these electrical connectors here. Let me know if you guys think that this Acura symbol is actually worth the 12 more horsepower that the VTEC gives. All right and now I can finally remove the wiring harness on the engine. Next up I'm going to remove the intake bolts. I'm going to work on removing this fuel rail next and release the fuel line. Remove the 10 millimeter bolts and remove the fuel rail and the fuel injectors. All right, now I'm going to remove this 12 millimeter bolt. Ah, that's actually a nut. I'm gonna remove the nut on this side. Ah, why does this have to be so tight? One more bolt in the middle here. So they've hidden three more bolts over here. I can't imagine getting this off in the car. And there's no direct access from this manifold. So I got a wrench on there, but this is a really stupid design in order to get the intake manifold off. I would have thought that a company like Honda would have made this a lot easier. All right, finally with everything removed, I can take off this intake. Now what makes this engine really special is this here, which is the VTEC solenoid. That gives you about 12 more horsepower than the standard D17. I'm gonna go ahead and remove it. And here you can see it's just a standard solenoid that's going to control the variable timing. There's a little spring in here. And here's the VTEC solenoid with the screen in here. And of course with any Honda this is a very common thing to leak. This is where the oil filter is located. I had to remove it in order to get the intake off. There's a frame filter but it looks brand new on the inside. So something's going on because the oil wasn't brand new. And down around the back of the engine here you can see this is the oil separator that goes from the PCV system straight back into the intake. And you can see the oil separator is just like a baffle to try and prevent some of that oil from entering the intake. But we know that that doesn't really work. Moving over to the side of the engine, we have this giant contraption here, which is the EGR system. It basically is going to take exhaust gases and then recirculate it back into the intake to get burned. And that's for emissions control. It's also got a cooling setup to it where you can see all the coolant lines go into here and that's going to help cool that gas before it goes in. So it appears that it's all 12 millimeter bolts and nuts that hold us to the block. And then remove the EGR cooler. And now I can pull off this crossover tube that takes coolant from the water pump. And here's where it's kind of obvious. You have the coolant passage that goes into the engine here and your exhaust passage that goes from the exhaust side over to the intake side here. So with the front and back removed, it's time to work on the top of the engine here. I'm going to remove these 10 millimeter bolts that hold the ignition coils on. All right, they're not completely burned out. Now I'm going to remove all the 10 millimeter nuts and bolts to hold the valve cover on. Now I can remove the valve cover. There is a little bit of buildup of carbon and sludge and it is a bit dark tarnished. The engine probably had a little bit of a rougher oil change interval than I'd like. Now taking a look under the valve cover, this engine had 192,000 kilometers on it and looks pretty decent for a mid mileage engine. You can see it uses a single overhead camshaft powered by a timing belt, not a timing chain and it's not a dual overhead cam setup. And as a result it has to use this roller rocker arm setup in order to take the camshaft's position, in order to take the camshaft position to directly act on the valves. Whereas in a dual overhead cam setup you'd have the camshafts directly acting on the valves itself. Now as a result and with most Hondas you have this little adjustment nut at the end of the rocker arm here to adjust the valve clearances and they do have to be adjusted periodically over the life of the engine. You can see some of these here it does have a little bit of play in them while some of them are nice and tight. You can also see we've got the extra VTEC arms over here and that's going to correspond with the extra lobe on the camshaft. That's going to enable a larger cam profile on the intake side so you get more air into this engine and it produces about 129 horsepower versus the 117 on the standard D17. I'm going to remove all the brackets in front of the side of the engine here which holds the alternator and the AC compressor. 
Just knock this cam bolt free while we still got tension on it. Here's a quick peek of the timing system. You can see you've got your single overhead camshaft here and of course the crankshaft down there and a spring-loaded tensioner down over inside of here and up here would be your water pump. And of course it's a good idea to replace the water pump with the timing belt. This one does look fresh but it also means that you're going to have to do this every so often as opposed to being a timing chain which usually lasts the life of the engine. Now because I'm not ready to open the timing system yet I'm going to remove the rocker arms first and then the head. We've got a bunch of 12 millimeter bolts across the top here. Okay, you're going to want to try to keep this together because it can easily fall apart just like that because it's got springs in them. And there's the roller rocker arm assembly. Alright, now I'm going to try to slide the timing belt off here. Now I don't have to deal with the timing side and take off the camshaft. Alright, next up I'm going to remove the 14 millimeter head bolts. I like how these head bolts are just a standard 14 millimeter socket and not some random hex or bitorx or something like that. All right, now I should be able to lift the head off. And here we come to one of the biggest failures on this engine. That's the head gasket. These are really known to fail on these engines and that's gonna cause them to overheat. Now when they overheat, the block or the head itself could actually become warped and then you lose compression. Now the gaskets on these are a multi-layer steel gasket. This one looks like it's probably the original at 192,000 kilometers. Now one of the telltale signs that your head gasket is leaking is the coolant here starts to disappear in the coolant jug on the radiator. That's because the coolant is not sealed between here and the combustion chamber and it's actually burning coolant in there. Furthermore, the oil, which is through these little passages over here, could also be mixing with the coolant and that causes a milkshake inside of the radiator and inside of the engine oil. And additionally, it could also leak externally where you have the oil leaking outside here or even coolant leaking outside here. Now, while the head gasket itself could probably be like 30 or 40 bucks, plus a bunch of other gaskets that you have to replace to get here, it's really the labor that catches you because you're pretty much doing a timing belt job, taking off the intake and the exhaust and a lot of other components in order to get this far in the engine. And that's why a lot of these seventh generation series get condemned because this engine isn't just worth fixing. Here you can also see you've got a completely open deck design. There's no reinforced between the combustion chamber and the block itself that you would find in like a Subaru or some other economy car. This is definitely more of an economy engine compared to the K-series that replaced it. Now since Honda crank bolts are known to be on there really tight, I'm not even going to attempt to open that. We're going to spin the engine upside it down and then see if we can open it. So I made a bit of a mess. I've got my wife's old dress here again. I'm going to set that up. Now, I don't think I've ever been able to rotate a crank so easily by hand. Now most Hondas use this aluminum alloy oil pan. It's good because it's fairly strong and a lot better than plastic. Although it will have a tendency to crack if you throw a connecting rod through it. A steel pan is obviously a little bit better because it will deform before it cracks. I'm going to go ahead and remove all the 10 millimeter bolts that go around the circumference of the oil pan. Now as you can tell, another weak spot on these Hondas is that they leak a lot of oil. The oil pan was leaking, the valve covers were leaking, the VTEC gasket was leaking. It's just a common thing on all these Hondas. I like how they gave you these pry points here, because they know you're going to have to replace this oil pan gasket yeah. soon. And there's the oil pan. Alright, I got something jammed in the connecting rod bearing over here. I'm going to see if I can take off this 19mm crank bolt nut. Oh, that was easy. Oh, I definitely did the timing belt and didn't tighten that. These things are known to be really, really tight, so much so that Honda built a hex in here so you can get a special tool in there to hold it. But since the crank bolt is now free and out of the way, I can remove this timing cover. Pop that off, and here you can see the timing belt. The belt has a little woodruff key inside, and there's the crank gear. Taking a look at the timing setup, once you have the crank gear, it's a very simple spring-loaded cam gear style of tensioner. There's no hydraulic tensioners or anything to release here. And over here you have the water pump. I'm going to zip off the four bolts holding the water pump on. You always have to change this when you do a timing belt because you pretty much have to do a timing belt job. Over here now we've got the crank position sensor. And there's the tensioner. Take a look at the bottom end of this D16 engine. You can see we have this ladder type of girdle over here. And that's there to support the main bearings. And also give this bottom end a little bit more power. Not that this D17 engine makes a lot of power in the first place. We're going to remove this oil pickup screen. And at 120,000 miles, I don't see anything in there. It's nice and clean. Now because of the design of the girdle crossing over each cylinder, I'm going to have to remove the main bearing caps first before I can remove the connecting rod. Alright, let's see if we can take that off there. 
Okay, let's check out some of that wear. Got my brother's old shirt here again, and we'll just wipe that off. So here I am a little bit disappointed. You can see that there's some lines here from a little bit of wear, but even more so you can see that there's these kind of burn spots here where the coatings actually come off on these parts over here. This just doesn't rub off like that. It's actually worn out. Now given its age, this engine's actually seen a lot of wear. Coming back over to the crankshaft itself, you can see there are a couple of lines on here from where the main bearing's attached to. All right, next up I'm going to remove all the 12 millimeter nuts that hold the connecting rod bearing caps on. Connecting rod bearings are in good shape. You can see there's just some minor lines on there, but other than that, no wear. I'm just gonna push the pistons down through the block. Pistons made a lot more mess than I thought. I got my brother's old hat here I just stole from his closet. I'm sure he won't mind, he doesn't have any hair anyways. Taking a look at these itty bitty pistons here, you can see they are pretty small. This is a 1.7 liter engine. Here you can see that the oil control ring here is completely clogged up. There's no passage in there for oil to return. So I bet you that this engine was probably burning a lot of oil. And the story is pretty much the same for the other pistons as well. They've also got a little bit of black stuff on the top here, but not too much carbon deposits per se. Now there's a little bit of resistance in the pistons wrist pin over here. It is a little bit above freezing, so I guess the oil viscosity is a little bit thicker. Actually, this one's super thicky. At least these pistons have a little bit of weight to it, unlike a Kia 4T engine where you can just throw that thing around like a feather. All right, next up, I'm gonna peel out this rear main seal. Now, before we can get this crankshaft out of here, we've got this oil pump, which is directly driven by it. The oil pickup tube directly slides in right here. We've got a couple of 10 mil wheel bolts. And there's the oil pump. It also comes with the front seal pressed into it. And here you can see where the oil feeds into the block. All right now I can remove the crankshaft. I get the block off the stand. All right, so now that this engine's all taken apart, let's take a closer look at how it works. I'm gonna begin by taking a look at the block. It's a really nice small block, good foundation for an economical engine. One cool thing I see is that most engines put the thrust bearing on the middle over here. This engine has the thrust bearing on the second to last bearing next to the transmission. Taking a look at the lubrication system on the D17, now you remember that the oil pump bolts up at the front here next to the crank seal and it's got its pickup tube. Now that oil pump is gonna create oil flow and that'll push it down straight through this oil galley over here to get filtered out by the oil filter. Now in most engines you'd have a main oil galley that runs along the middle and feeds the crankshaft bearings. However in this engine the oil galley goes up and over to the girdle that attached onto the top here and that'll feed the connecting rod bearings. Here's that girdle and you can see this hole here is what's going to feed this hole over here. The oil is going to come across to this central galley over here and that's going to individually feed the crankshaft bearings and also the connecting rod bearing. Personally, would have preferred them getting rid of this failure point where it could leak oil pressure and just have a central galley running through the whole block. I also prefer engines that have oil pumps that are internal inside the engine crankcase as opposed to this one which is external and could leak out here which they commonly do on Hondas. Looking down the side of the block here, you can see this is where the oil galley is gonna to lead to the secondary hole here, which goes up to feed the head with oil. There's not much of the cooling system on this block. You've got the water pump, which sits over here, and that's gonna pump coolant all throughout this open deck design, and then into the head to cool things down. Now coming back to the head here, we've already discussed the all too famous head gasket issue that these engines face. Luckily, they're not too difficult to replace while they're in the vehicle, and these engines are pretty cheap and easy to work on anyway. Now with 192,000 kilometers, this engine combustion chambers actually look pretty clean. Even more so, check out how clean the intake ports are. This does have port injection, which means the gasoline fires right behind those valves and help clean them out, but there is zero carbon buildup in behind those valves. And what really makes these engines unique is that they incorporate both VTEC and EGR. Now, unlike an overall dual overhead cam engine where you have two camshafts, one on the intake side here and one over on the exhaust, and those directly act on these valves over here. In this case, you have a single overhead camshaft and that's driven off of a timing belt directly. Now that camshaft has to both control the intake and the exhaust side, and that's why you have so many cam lobes on here. Now sitting on top of that camshaft over there is this roller rocker arm system, and that's going to take the motion as this camshaft is rotating through this roller over here and transfer it to the rocker, which is going to move up and down. Now that up and down motion of the rocker arm is going to be acted directly on the valve through here, which is held up by the valve spring, and that's gonna open up the valves. And of course, the more you open the valve, the more air is gonna come in for that period of time that the valve is open. And that's where the VTEC system kicks in. Now, I've already got another video on how VTEC works if you wanna see that in more detail. But in essence, you have these two roller rocker arms over here, and they're both following two cam profiles that are different over here side by side to each other. So let's use these two roller rocker arms as an example. These valves are just gonna be floating along as the camshaft is turning, and it's gonna be opening and closing the valve. 
Maybe this one's opening and closing the valve all the way, whereas this one is barely opening and closing the valve at all. And looking at the camshaft profile here, you can see this one's barely opening the valve at all, whereas this one has this high point over here. Now when VTEC kicks in, yo, this oil control valve is going to turn on and that's going to send oil down this shaft over here, which is going to lock these two roller arms together so they both roll at the same higher rate as the taller cam profile over here. And that in turn is going to open up both valves at the higher rate, which is going to allow more air to enter the engine. Now the VTEC system was actually pretty unique, especially for an economy car, to be adding about 15 horsepower using this very complicated setup. Now going back to the head here, the oil is going to be sent up through this hole over here into this little galley, and then down into the middle across to the VTEC solenoid located here. Here you can see where they've drilled that hole for the oil pressure to come in through this VTEC solenoid. And of course the solenoid itself is just a little plunger that's going to push out when activated, and that's going to push over here creating a gap, which is what's going to release the oil pressure and send it up to the head. That oil pressure is then going to be released over here and sent over to this hole, which correlates to this hole over here, and then sent out to this rocker arm shaft over here to engage the VTEC yoke. Now the other feature of this engine head here is the EGR system. Here you can see we've got the exhaust side of the engine. Now part of that exhaust is going to be sent out through this little hole over here, where we have the EGR system that's going to bolt up to it. Here's where the EGR is going to come out, here's where the exhaust gas has come out, and then here's where it goes back into the intake side. Now this here is the EGR valve. This is also a common issue with almost all Hondas because they tend to clog up and that'll cause drivability issues or your engine to surge. Now the point of the EGR system is to recirculate some of the exhaust gases to help with pollution and emissions. Now by having that hot exhaust gas attached to this cooling jacket over here, it helps to cool those exhaust gases as it goes back into the intake system so you get better combustion. And here's the EGR valve. And here you can see the EGR passage here as the intake has to go over to the exhaust side. This big giant thing here is your EGR valve which is going to control the amount of flow that goes over from the intake to the exhaust side. Sometimes these also fail as well, but most likely they just get clogged up with carbon. Now the exhaust gases get sent in through the side of the head here and then come to this intake plate where you can see this hole here. You can see there's a lot of carbon built up inside of there. Look at all that stuff. This little piece here is your intake plate that kind of separates the EGR system from the actual intake system. This plate here has these little channels in them that is going to allow some of the air to be distributed across to the different cylinders over here. Now the problem as you can see here is look how carved up this is. This thing is completely blocked up. You can't even get proper air to flow inside of here. Honda did have a secret warranty on some vehicles to clean all this junk out. Nevertheless, this plate over here also houses the injectors. That's where they would go in and give you your port injection. Of course, here we have the intake, which has the stupid bolt design behind there and really hard to get to on the vehicle, much less even off the vehicle. You still have to get like a ratcheting wrench inside of here to get that out. I really wonder how Honda managed that on the production line. And there's a look at the Honda D-Series engine. Now, while this engine is very economical and cheap to run, it does have have quite a lot of drawbacks. Of course the R series and even the K series was a drastic improvement over this engine and you probably should opt for one of those. Make sure you subscribe if you want to see more videos just like this one.